Jedi Deepfake Simulacrum is a top-down shooter by an indie developer known as No Day Shall Erase You. They were kind enough to send me a Steam key, but this is a no-strings-attached kind of deal. I'm free to say whatever I want about it, or to simply not review it. But I'm going to, because this is a very special game and I think more people ought to know about it. The game starts with a simple message. You've been in a terrible accident, but some mysterious benefactor has salvaged your body and brought you back online. You are now one million dollars in debt. But don't worry, you're given a gun and a laptop and told that you can work off your debt by doing some contracting for your benefactors, known only as the Corporation. The premise tells you all that you need to know about the world. It's some time in the future, everyone's a cyborg, and if the CRT filter didn't clue you in, we're doing retro future cyberpunk. With its lo-fi aesthetic and point-and-click gunplay, DDS presents itself as a game in the style of Hotline Miami. You go out on missions in discrete locations, usually to infiltrate, assassinate, or just go ham and wipe everybody out. To round out your arsenal, you've got grenades, melee, and even a bullet time ability. What immediately sets DDS apart from other shooters of its type is its hacking system. Right away, it's easy to notice that we're more sluggish and inept than the likes of Jacket and the fans, but that's all right because we have two powerful tools that they didn't. By spending a resource called Slug, we can slow down time, and by pressing Tab, we can pop open a text parser. This is where most of the magic happens. We can hack pretty much everything in the game. Sure, you could pull a JC Denton and hack a turret. You could even hop on the camera hub and shut the whole system down. But that's amateur hour. You can hack everything but the walls and floor in this game, so why not hack an enemy and befriend them? Hack network hubs to find all the connected devices. Hack a car and run people over with it. Hack a fridge to eat all the food. Hack a computer to read all the emails. Hack a toilet to explode. Hack an ammo station to wirelessly resupply your gun somehow. Hack a repair station to badly injure any enemies that try to use it. Here's an idea. Activate your bullet time and hack the actual bullets out of the air before they can hit you. There are a few limitations to hacking's awesome power. One is that while the laptop is open, we're pretty much helpless. This leads to a lot of frantic finger fumbling as you try to find the right commands. Your network graph functions as a radar which can detect enemies, but it's difficult to pay attention to all three windows at once. You're constantly fighting a battle with sensory overload, and it pretty quickly becomes clear that in a visual style of higher fidelity, there would simply be too much to keep track of. But don't worry if you're not a Nova Hot Cowboy in meat space. You can enable easy hacks. This greatly simplifies the hacking commands and even allows you to do it on a gamepad. In fact, you can adjust pretty much anything you want. DDS has some of the most permissive accessibility and difficulty options I have ever seen. Personally, I like to leave things on default, as I assume that's the developer intended way to play. But some of these missions had me considering hitting the sliders. DDS, at its defaults, does not go easy on the player. Most enemies will kill you in 1-3 to three shots, and some bullets will bounce, track your movement, or even explode. Once, I was on a train, and a guy threw a sofa at me and made me fall to my death. Oh yeah, about that. Remember how you're a million dollars in debt just because you died once? That service didn't suddenly become free just because you're an indentured servant now. Every time you die, you're another million in the hole. You might die 10 or 20 times just to finish a mission that only pays 10k, and then what? The missions are constantly getting harder. You're gonna need better bodies and bigger booms if you want to keep up with the baddies, who are all surely in the same predicament. A core tenet of cyberpunk is that the only winning move is to cheat. I didn't wind up touching the sliders when I played, but something I did do was take on a mission that was way higher level than me. I was able to kill an enemy near the starting area and score a gun that was way higher level than anything I could afford. With my low level skeleton and poor skills, I didn't stand a chance of completing the mission, so I simply quit out of it, and the game let me keep my gun. Cheese? Maybe. But the game is expecting the player to do these kinds of things. And it's not going to go easy on you just because you have a code of honor. Throughout your adventure, you'll also find chiplets. These are usually hidden in secret or optional areas during missions. 
Back at your apartment, they can be exchanged for abilities and perks that dramatically change how you play. For my playthrough, I chose the Empath vocation, which allowed me to instantly befriend enemies with a projectile attack, or later on to summon a friendly succubus who could do the same. Later on, I specced into the Hacker Tree, which seems to widely be considered one of the best. I became able to detect enemies and computers through walls, and while this would prematurely alert enemies, it would also let me hack and befriend them from a position of safety. My MO became to carefully explore a level to collect enough precious data points for my hacks, then I would spend them all befriending everything I possibly could. Once it got really spicy, I'd summon the succubus and find some place to hide. Failing that, well, there's always my overpowered gun. Even if you're doing quite well, it quickly becomes clear that you're in far over your head. The concierge, your condescendingly sweet handler, has you between a rock and a hard place. Mysterious third parties are sending you mission offers that either don't pay or seem like something you probably shouldn't be doing. Nobody's on your side, and it's in this situation that the plot begins to emerge from the phosphor haze of procedurally generated ultraviolence. It is technically possible to simply complete a couple dozen missions without ever dying, settle up at the bank, and bootstrap yourself out of your situation, but it is certainly not likely. So what's a contract killer to do in this post-freedom, post-death, post-human dystopia? Well, that's up to you, and you do have options. Taking on certain missions may guide you down a path other than the one that your employers have prescribed for you, and depending on how you go about these missions, you may get different reactions out of people. There are even hidden objectives to complete, which can further alter the course of the story. Visually, the game is very simple. To repeat myself, this is a good thing. There is a lot to keep track of in this world, and having it all dumbed down to Caves of Cud style sprites and glyphs makes it far easier to process. Dialogue will often feature portraits. Mostly, they're these mangled anime girl faces that give you kind of the impression of early generation AI art. It's part of the aesthetic, certainly, but at the same time it conveys the loss of identity and personhood in the setting. You're the property of a corporation running around in a mass-produced robot body to do their bidding. What use do you or any of these other people have for faces? The soundtrack eschews the synthwave that has dominated this genre for the last decade. Instead, you get these soft, jazzy numbers on piano and bass. Somehow, it fits. The protagonist's situation is pretty dire, but there's an irreverent tone on display that reminds you to relax. The writing is funny without ever seeming like it tries too hard. I wouldn't say the story is robust. We've all heard the one about the debt-ridden cyborg stuck in the run-and-gun rat race, but there are plenty of surprising moments and intriguing conversations to keep you invested, and it's all punctuated with visual gags that range from clever to surprisingly dark. I completed my first run in about nine hours, but I took one of the easier endings, and at the time of this review, there's a fair amount of story content I haven't seen, though I fully intend to. This is a new game, and while it's technically still in early access, it does feel pretty complete. However, the developer is still actively bug-fixing and adding content, so there's plenty to come in the future. If you're looking for an arcade-style game to decompress with at your own pace, you could certainly do worse. If you want a challenge with a high skill ceiling and room for creative game-breaking, this one deserves a spot on your wish list. If you just dig the vibe and want to explore a one-of-a-kind game, I can confidently say this one's approachable for people of any skill level. The developer is really bent over backwards to make their game accessible, and all without diminishing the hardcore experience for those that want it. Dead Eye Deep Fake Simulacrum can be found on Steam or itch.io at the links provided in the description. Thank you.